I'm Artie Ojeda. Welcome to SDSU Insider, giving you an inside look at San Diego's oldest and largest university, where students are gaining the skills they need to become the leaders of the future. And those leadership skills are never more critical than in health care. In today's show, we will show you how SDSU's School of Nursing students are being trained to replace a retiring workforce and serve a larger aging population. We'll go inside a lab where students are getting hands-on training, treating patients before they ever step into a hospital. Plus, we sit down with Sharp Healthcare Executive Vice President and Aztec alum Dan Gross to learn how his company is helping to support this future generation of nurses. Later, 2012 is an Olympic year, so who better to check in with than someone who has competed on the world's largest stage? Aztec's head track and field coach and two-time Olympian, Sheila Burrell, plus you'll meet SDSU running sensation Allison Reeser. But first, SDSU is part of an $18.5 million grant that will revolutionize the relationship between man and machine and eventually help people who have been paralyzed move again. Take a look. It used to be considered the stuff of science fiction, a man built with bionic parts. But in SDSU's engineering research center, the $6 million man is being created in real life. This is a uh, research for a bionic man. And uh, that uh, has now the robotic device as a part of uh, the human body, but will be controlled by the brain. The research is being funded by the National Science Foundation and is a partnership with the University of Washington and MIT. The National Science Foundation Engineering Research Center is perhaps the most competitive grant program that they offer. National Science Foundation is all about creating new innovative technologies. Perhaps what's more important is that the technology we'll be developing is really innovative. I'm really excited about that. This ability to interface a human with a machine is critical. The way that we do it right now through a mouse and a keyboard and a screen will be relatively primitive compared to what is generated through this technology. SDSU's team of mechanical engineers is working to develop brain-based sensors that will interact with the nervous system to control both muscles and robotics. The first stage of the, uh, you know, the project we will concentrate on uh, making the wearable or interactive device and uh, uh, the, that will control you know, the, the, the robotic device. But eventually we will uh, make a device that will be implantable and biocompatible to the human body. Clearly a key application of that will be able to bypass a spinal injury where the communication between the brain and the limb has gone away and to be able to provide new communication streams through sensors, through wireless communication, through a computer interface. It'll have feedback both ways. Not only will you be able to move an arm or a leg, but you'll also be able to get back feeling from that arm or leg. Over the next 10 years, the technology developed by SDSU engineering faculty will transform how man and machine interface. The brain is such a wonderfully complex uh, organ that all we need to do is provide pathways for it to communicate with a computer, and we think that that will be incredibly revolutionary. SDSU's Engineering Research Center is just one example of the life-changing research being done here on Montezuma Mesa. Coming up on SDSU Insider, we will go inside a training lab helping student nurses get a head start on working with patients. SDSU's School of Nursing is the largest training school for baccalaureate nurses in the San Diego region, graduating hundreds of nurses every year, many of whom go right into the local workforce. For new nurses, the first time treating a patient can be very intimidating, and that's where the SDSU Sharp Healthcare Human Patient Simulation Center comes in. Good morning, Mr. Garcia. How are you feeling this Okay, my name is Adriana, I'm gonna be your nurse today. These SDSU nursing students are helping a patient recover from a major health emergency. 
But this isn't just any patient, and this isn't your average ER. Do you have any questions for us? Uh, what's your name again? Adriana. Meet Jose Garcia. He's one of seven patients inside this mock hospital wing on the SDSU campus. What's that for? This is to help give you some oxygen. Oh. To help the you Sharp Healthcare brain. Human Patient Simulation yeah. Center gives SDSU nursing students hands-on experience in a safe, consequence-free environment. We try to keep things as real as possible here in simulation. So the students come prepared for a clinical experience. They come in their uniform. They come and treat the patients as if they were real patients. Every semester, 600 nursing students get to test their skills on everything from starting an IV to using the medication delivery system common in most hospitals. When they come into simulation, it's as if they were taking care of a real patient. So we're enforcing the safety things of the five rights of medication administration. We're talking about hand washing. We're talking about um, hand gel all those kinds of things that promote patient safety. For students like Kristen Jelmhaug, time spent with these simulated patients is crucial. The sim lab is really helpful because it's a really safe place to make mistakes and to practice things because if you make a mistake here, it's not a big deal and you can learn from it. The simulations not only help students put together what they learn in the classroom, but it reminds them of the little things that can be easy to forget for new nurses. Like the little things like, um, I don't know, cleaning the IV site with the, with the alcohol swab. Like, you always remember, but if you forget it here, that's always engraved in the back of your head. You still need to know how your body's processing those sugars, right? Uh, yeah. Sharp Healthcare provided the yeah. seed money to create the center and has continued to support the nursing program, including new funding this year for student scholarships. I appreciate that that an organi organization that large cares enough to invest back in us, their future nurses. Such a terrific opportunity for students. And the driving force, the corporate muscle behind the program comes in part from a man who's passionate about San Diego State, Dan Gross. He's an Aztec. Thank you so much for joining us. Nurses are, in fact, the lifeblood of the healthcare industry. What do you see as the role of nurses in the success of SHARP? Well, I think uh, the success of SHARP is obviously due to many, many people, but at the core of it has to be our, our, our nurses. When we take a look at our workforce at SHARP Healthcare, the single largest clinical professional group providing care to this community are our nurses. It's also always the nurses there, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and they have this extraordinary passion to help and care and heal people. And so they really are our extraordinary caregivers that make a true difference in this community. And of course, Sharp Healthcare has been such a big supporter of SDSU's nursing program. Why is it so important that Sharp Healthcare play a role in the education of future nurses? Well, San Diego State has been an extraordinary partner, uh, not only for Sharp Healthcare, but for San Diego in general. When we take a look at uh, their academic mission and how the individuals come out of San Diego State and they populate our workforce, it's amazing. And nursing uh, is no different. And so when we look to uh, the future and we think about uh, all of these uh, nurses who are going to retire in the next decade, decade and a half, we need to have replacements and we need to have new, young, talented nurses and San Diego State is there. They're the largest uh, baccalaureate nursing program within this community. And so it's our responsibility at Sharp Healthcare to partner with San Diego State to make certain that not only our workforce needs are met, but the community's healthcare needs are met. I want to talk to you about something that I know you're passionate about. What is the Sharp Healthcare Professional Education and Research Institute, and what do you envision for it in the future? Well, uh, Education Research Institute is something that's really uh, given our organization a great deal of pride, and it's really that opportunity to partner with San Diego State and to think about how we collaboratively can create scholarships and produce research that basically assists in making certain that our caregivers are informed and that they are being able to provide the best care possible. So into the future, we look at this institute and we think about how Sharp Healthcare and San Diego State University can uh, further our education mission and make certain that we have proven uh, research to direct our care practices in our organization. 
Part of the Institute is the Sharp Human Patient Simulation Center, which we just saw in the piece before us. How do experiences like this help prepare nurses for, for the real world? Well, the Human uh, Simulation Lab uh, is a great, great example of how uh, a healthcare system and an academic environment can come together partner and ensure that we're providing the best education for our future nurses. When you think of that simulation lab, let me give you a, a quick example. Most nurses prior to that simulation lab might not ever experience something we call the code blue or a patient who has cardiac arrest or some life-threatening condition until they're really out there in the workforce and confronted with it for the very first time. With our simulation lab, that's not the case. They have that opportunity to have that simulation long before that first real life experience, and they are better prepared, better equipped to handle it, and then we have better clinical outcomes for our patients. Absolutely. Dan, as an SDSU alumnus, how did your time at SDSU uh, prepare you for your role as, as a leader, a true leader in the healthcare industry? You know, my time at San Diego State University was extraordinary. Uh, I uh, received my master's degree from San Diego State, and it truly helped me have a, a broad view on how to um, be an effective leader, how to bring about change, how to understand all of the variables that influence business. It also helped me know how to have a uh, orientation towards critical thinking and more of an analytical, uh, scientific approach to decision making. Uh, it really gave me the foundation, I believe, to have that uh, academic knowledge, that didactic content uh, to go out into the workplace and put it to use. You're also a board member for SDSU's fundraising auxiliary, of course, the Campanile Foundation. Why do you feel that personally that it's so important to give back? Uh, it's fascinating to look at that foundation board, and when you do, you see such extraordinary community members, people with great minds, uh, great philanthropic hearts. And, um, you know, when you look at a university such as San Diego State and you see what they give to this community, it's our inherent responsibility to give back to that university. And it's, a, it's my honor, and uh, I love trying to help raise money for this extraordinary organization. Well, it's been my honor having the chance to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time and contributions. Dan Gross. Sharp Healthcare is one of the many corporations that have donated to the Campaign for SDSU, which has raised more than $300 million for SDSU students, faculty, and programs. You can learn more about how to get involved in the Campaign for SDSU at www.sdsu.edu slash campaign. Coming up on SDSU Insider, it's an Olympic year, which means track and field is always the sport to watch. We catch up with one of SDSU's standout runners and her coach, who knows a thing or two about performing on the world's most competitive stage. When Allison Reeser laces up her running shoes, watch out. Last year, the kinesiology major put together one of the best freshman seasons in school history. And this season, she's already off to a fast start. Let's meet the student athlete who could be the next SDSU athlete to compete in the Olympics. Allison Reeser is more than a runner. My name is Allison Reeser. I do, I run track and field and I do the heptathlon. She's considered a jack of all trades in the track world. The heptathlon is over two days. It's seven events. Um, the first event is the hurdles and then it goes high jump, shot put, 200. And on the second day, um, you run the long jump, javelin, and 800. Which makes her success even more impressive. Allison is on track this season to qualify for the Olympic trials. And if she doesn't make it to London this year, four years from now. Yeah, Rio de Janeiro. So I really wanted to go to um, the trials this, this year. And in four years, I would love to be in the Olympics myself. Those sky high goals keep her focused. Yeah, a lot of goals. I have a lot. For each event, I have like a specific time I want to hit or distance I want to jump or how far I want to throw. Her training is rigorous, often practicing twice a day around classes and other student responsibilities. The fitness and nutrition major says diet is a big part of her success. Food is like my fuel for the next day. So just thinking like, if I want to do well tomorrow, I have to prepare today, like eat right. With the glimmer of determination in her eye, Allison knows the best may be yet to come. That's the goal. So that's like where 
like this hard work is going to pay off. What an athlete and typically behind every great performer there's a great mentor or coach and that is certainly the case for Allison. Joining us now is a uh, women's track and field coach and two time Olympian Sheila Burrell. Thank you so much uh, for being here Sheila. Thanks for you know having Allison me. is so impressive. What is it about her that makes her so successful? Um, Allison probably is the most competitive person that you know I've thus far coached. You know what makes her successful is she does the small things. The small things are a big deal to her. She has fun. I've gotten lots of uh, comments from other coaches and officials about Allison when she's competing about how much fun she looks like she's having out there. But I'll tell you what, Allison's the kind of kid that every practice is like a track meet to her. She definitely she doesn't like she does not like to lose. So she's got that extra sort of you know, she's going to do whatever it takes to, to win attitude. Just a tenacious competitor. Very now, much so. now, this is your third season with the Aztecs. How is it going compared to the previous two years? This year is probably, um, I was telling my team as we got ready for the indoor season, this is probably the most prepared we are for the, out, for the, out, for the indoor season. But also, we've had two, two meets already. We've already got two kids ranked in the top 10 of the country. We had the number two triple jumper in the country. We had a number nine thrower in the country. Allison's going to be one of the top multis in the country. And so we've, got, we've gotten to the point now here at San Diego State in my third year where we're really solid and we're on the verge of making that you know, consistent national ranking. Well, they certainly have a, a great coach to look up to. Uh, many people may not know it, but you're an Olympian who competed in the heptathlon. Tell us about that experience. Um, I made the 2000 Sydney Olympic Games and the 2004 Athens Olympic Games and, you know, was blessed and had the opportunity to win five U.S. national championships. And so, you know, my Olympic experience, you know, from the two Olympics was very different. In 2004, I got fourth uh, in Athens. And in, in 2000, I got 26th. And both of them came, you know, getting fourth was, was probably the most difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a hard place to be, but, um, you know, got fourth with an injury. And so it was, it was very fruitful, I'll say, as an experience that now has allowed me to do what I do now and be able to help sure. bring other athletes in who have that same goal to help them get there. You know, take us to, to Sydney and Athens. What is it like competing on the international level representing the U.S.? I've gotten that question a lot. I think the competition, as an athlete, being in the Olympic Games, it's a little different from being a spectator. And I would say that the coolest thing to me or the, the most exciting thing to me about being in the Olympic Games wasn't necessarily the competition. The Olympic Games are what you make it. It's opening ceremonies. That's probably the best experience ever because when you walk into a stadium with, you know, when the United States walks into a stadium and there's hundreds of thousands of people standing around cheering USA, and it's the loudest, it's the loudest cheer of any other country, that's when you realize that you're one of a very small group sure. of people who have the opportunity to be in that position. And the whole world is watching and cheering for you. So that's probably the coolest thing for me about the Olympics, uh, outside of the competition, is when you finally realize that this is a pretty special place to be. How does your Olympic experience, I, 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 you know, I'm trying to visualize that, and I could just you know, get goosebumps thinking about that. How, how does your Olympic experience um, influence the way you coach today? Um, I don't know. I didn't mean to stump you there, Sheila. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think motivationally, it that the whenever we whenever we have team meetings or we talk, I always talk about what it takes to be a great competitor, or what it takes, or how you handle certain situations competitively, or how you handle adversity. And this is what you should think about. This is what you should do. This is what it feels like. I think from that perspective, being able to take, you know, this group of athletes that we're working with and work with collegiate athletes and share with them what the ins and outs are of the challenges and some of the things you have to deal with as competing in competing at a, you know, a high level or even competing period has been the biggest help and the biggest thing that has impacted them. I can tell you these kids definitely, uh, respect the fact that I was an Olympian and they definitely look up to me for it because when I share with them I share this is what it's like when you get to a competition this is what it's like and this is what can happen and so I think from that perspective just taking that experience and being able to collapse time if you will sure so you collapse time where these are some of the, these are things that you have to do to get from A to B let me tell you how to get there where you don't have to go through all the things in between that are a waste of time to get to this level yeah well without a doubt 
The student athletes here at San Diego State are certainly fortunate to have a mentor like you. Sheila Burrell, thank you so much for being with thank us. Thank you very much, Art. Once upon a time when hardly anyone lived in the shadow of Cowles Mountain, the peak that dominates the skyline north of Montezuma Mesa belonged to San Diego State. When the SDSU campus moved from its downtown location 80 years ago, students found themselves surrounded by miles of undeveloped chaparral and a mountain overlooking it all. Just three miles from campus and the highest point in the city at 1,591 feet, Cowles Mountain seemed the perfect billboard to advertise Aztec pride. Coles Mountain is something that has been traversed by San Diego students for about 80 years and most importantly for about 60 of those years the students would go up and would paint a giant S on the side of the mountain. It was the largest collegiate symbol on the planet. It was 400 feet long or tall however you look at it. The idea had been pitched by students and enthusiastically embraced by then SDSU president Edward Hardy. He liked it so much he declared a Labor Day, a holiday for students to go up and paint the mountain. And so about 500 students went up and saying that they painted the mountain isn't entirely correct because what they did is they used lime and water and they framed it and then they swept it. And so this was this to, to make a whitewashed, a giant whitewashed S. It was the students way of claiming their new home. What a shock it was for the students to go from the University Heights campus, which was in the center of a bustling city to move out to this rural area. There was nothing around for miles, and that's one of the reasons they took on this tradition, was if you're going to be out way, way out in the countryside, why not have that symbol that you can see from the campus? Pulling it off required back-breaking work and mathematical precision. The amount of rocks, lime, and water and other supplies to bring up here is, is pretty amazing to think about. And when you look at some of those old photos, you can see them building stretchers to carry these rocks up and they had to clear the area. And now it's a, it's a well manicured trail that we got to go up. But to think about what they had to do in the past, it's pretty phenomenal. A math professor named Livingstone was on the top of Hardy Tower. And he was the one guiding them. He had survey equipment up there. And he was the one guiding them telling them how to make the S look proportional. Maintaining S Mountain, as students dubbed it, became an important campus tradition. The tradition got really, really big in the 50s and 60s. In fact, it was part of the official orientation week in the 1960s. All freshmen were required to do it. It was on their calendar of events. 70s, it kept going, but started to die down, and then no one was doing it in the 80s and 90s. The last time it was done was for the centennial in 1997. Professor Henry Jansen brought a group up, and they used flashlights to do the S instead of any sort of lime or paint. When they lit it up, it worked. They didn't know it was going to work using flashlights at the top of the mountain, but people were able to see them from the 8, and so it was fun. You can read more about the history of Cowles Mountain in the spring issue of SDSU's 360 Magazine online now at sdsu.edu 360. And you may have heard that San Diego State University is making a big change when it comes to athletics. In 2013, SDSU football will be joining the storied Big East Conference. The move is expected to raise SDSU's profile nationally with more opportunities to compete in major bowls and be seen by a larger television audience. Most other sports will be moving to the Big West, which means all of the teams will be playing in more regional markets, giving our alumni and fans more opportunities to see Aztec teams play in person. Finally, before we go, we wanted to tell you about the Aztec Leadership Network. So many of SDSU's 260,000 living alumni are leaders of businesses and organizations. They're CEOs, presidents, founders, and partners. The Aztec Leadership Network puts all of this information into a map demonstrating the reach and impact SDSU alumni have in all walks of life. We hope you'll use the map to find and support SDSU alumni-owned businesses. You can check it out at sdsu.edu slash leadership starts here. That's all for this episode of SDSU Insider. For SDSU News Every Day, visit our website at newscenter.sdsu.edu edu and join the conversation on our Facebook page and Twitter. 
Thanks again so much for joining us and go Aztecs. I believe that we. I believe that we.